Sam Libby, I work here in the Boulder area for Esri. Um, I'm on our professional services team, which means I do projects for our customers. I assume many people here are familiar with Esri and ArcGIS. Um, some may not be, and I won't spend too much time on that, but we're going to be talking about some work we've been doing in general with OSM and the community, kind of from different directions, as well as this specific project that Nick's been helping out with. Want to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Nick Doran. I've been working with Esri as a contractor on this project. Uh, I have some other connections with OpenStreetMap and open source and things like that. So I'm really interested in sharing this project with you. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the business case we have for adding ArcGIS data through ID. Uh, Nick will talk a little bit about the development process um, and how we've integrated into ID as part of that. And then we'll take some questions at the end. I hope uh, to have some feedback as well. So what is it? What we're trying to do is add a button to ID in the map data tab that allows you to add a geo service. And what is a geo service is a fair next question. Uh, what this would allow people to do is review and add geometries and attributes to the ID kind of interface in their browser from existing data that's exposed through one of our ArcGIS REST services. Uh, we produce software for server kind of grade infrastructure that people can use to expose their geo data from ArcGIS systems, so that's used across many counties, cities, state governments, federal governments, as well as internationally. And many of you may be familiar with the REST endpoint, which looks a little bit like this. Oops. So this is the REST API documentation. This is an open doc that we have, and a REST API endpoint looks like this, which is basically our public-facing HTML interface to open geodata that you can query for different applications and for different use cases. I'll get a little more into it later. So this would basically provide a guided interface through ID that would let you add this data to the map for a small location, uh, map attributes from that data source into OSM tags, and also review each feature before the change set is submitted. Uh, this is, again, as Nick said, been funded through our, our hiring of him to help develop it, and it's a contribution we've been trying to make to the community. The next question really is uh, what we're going to cover in the presentation. I'll try to go through why uh, this is a problem we're trying to solve for our users, how this will help the community overall and the quality of OSM data, uh, what kind of people would use this, if, if anyone, hopefully, and what are some ways we've tried to develop the tool to prevent incorrect, low quality, or unlicensed edits, um, as well as a brief coverage of what else we're doing with OSM. So what we're trying to solve is basically that, and, and this is my personal opinion, but I think it's a fair statement, a lot of time and money has been spent over the past 50 years to build high quality geodata in many places around the world. So a lot of organizations maintain their own data. Uh, we just heard earlier about an hour ago from the city of Boulder in a panel discussion they did about how the city's you know, spent a lot of time and money, in this case taxpayer dollars, to build great geodata that should be available to more people. Uh, the REST interface I showed earlier is not the most user-friendly, clearly. Uh, they can build apps to show that, but we'd love to find ways to get that data back into open data sets like OSM. And so our customers have asked us repeatedly through different means for tools to be able to submit data to OSM that's already managed with Esri, Esri tools. So if they already use our stuff to manage the data, which many of them do, how do we get that into OSM easily, reliably, and, and carefully, most importantly? This, uh, these data are, are, are largely made available more and more through open APIs and friendly licenses. We have a lot of work to do on that to educate our, our customers and our community about licenses, but it's growing as a, an area of interest. And they've often already benefited from very close local review and represent key local knowledge that's been collected by that community. Getting that data into OSM is currently quite difficult from both a technical and policy perspective. Uh, that came up during the last talk from the city of Boulder, that as a GIS analyst for a city or county government, how do you even get started with the import process for OSM, right? There's a lot of wikis to read, there's a lot of uh, mailing list chatter to, to, to read up on in the, in the background. And um, it's very intimidating, speaking as a person who's looked at that in the past. Um, but at the same time, imports have also been beneficial, or I would argue, essential to large parts of the OSM data set. And we, we have always had a tool for at least the past five years that's a, a desktop editor for OSM data that allows people to download a chunk of data into ArcMap, make some changes or use it in their own, for their own purposes, and then submit changes back to the community. This is just one example of an area in New Zealand on the coast near, um, near Wellington that shows the current OSM base map on the left with an example of some overlapping building data that we have from that community that they've published out and digitized either through a vendor or their own purposes. Uh, and I would love to see those two maps become closer together without somebody going through and having to manually draw each of those buildings when they already exist. 
I'll let Nick talk about a little bit about, about development as well. Cool. Okay. So uh, it's sort of difficult approaching this project because there's no plug-in standard for ID. I think you've heard throughout the day a couple of different people, including the Facebook uh, machine learning presentation. People are trying to integrate with ID to connect it to different processes, and there's no existing standard. Uh, what we wanted to do was to, as much as possible, reduce our diff for, or in our branch to one JavaScript module and compare it to other SVG layers. For example, when you add a GPX layer, there's a module just to resolve it around GPX files and overlays. So trying to do that same kind of system and then also modify the uh, existing UI system and some integrations into the entity editor, which is where you select different tags and presets. Uh, also, in order to do some of the work that we wanted to do, avoiding, for example, overlapping uh, data, we have some GIS modules added to the package.json. Uh, some of the, the only existing method that's in ID right now to create a vector data within OpenStreetMap is drawing it. When you put the GPX in, it's actually only like a, a raster tile. It doesn't actually, it's not, not when you upload GPX file, you can't then start editing it like it's OpenStreetMap data. We wanted to make sure the data that was added was native, was in the same environment and of the same editability as any other data in the ID editor once it's imported in. Uh, then we, uh, so sort of finding the right methods to attach that and put them together in the same way that when you draw things, they get added and edited in the OpenStreetMap system. Uh, and because of that, we are able to still use other parts of the ID tools for drawing, for editing, for undo and redo. Uh, we're also using some existing presets. So any preset that you can select in the ID editor for something that you're drawing, you can use that to get started on something that's more complex. For example, if you can't remember the right tag for a school or for a particular item or a driveway, I guess would be a good thing to hint at here. Uh, you can find the preset in the interface and get the same benefits that you would had you been drawing that manually. And sort of trying to come up with the idea of, you know, there are a lot of different fields in a geoservice and trying to make sure that we can map them to uh, OpenStreetMap fields and leave out fields that we find are unnecessary. So sort of going through this process and trying to figure out what's the gap between the geoservice and the OpenStreetMap data model. Um, okay. All right, cool. So let's do a little demonstration. So I'll try to I'll try to pull my tabs up ahead of time, so hopefully it works. Um, again, this is the REST API documentation. This is a, a version of ID running on, on Nick's server. This is live on GitHub, so you can go see it right now. I'll show some links at the end. And what we've really added in is this additional button on the map data tab. Hopefully that's big enough. I tried to make it big enough and not too big to not see the screen. Um, so this is an additional button we've added just in the existing interface that says add geoservice layer. Um, when I open that, it opens a new modal that lets me put in a URL. In this case, I've already identified a layer from the county of Boulder, since we're here in Boulder, as well as a location that serves well for my purpose. This is obviously a planned demo. But this is building footprints uh, in Boulder County. If you look at the um, existing data, we have some nice streets here. This is a relatively new development that doesn't have any building footprints. I can easily go in and start to draw these, but it might take me 20 minutes to do the whole neighborhood. Just in this small area, uh, I happen to know that the county data already exists for that. So if I go to here and copy my URL from this layer, I'll be asked first, once I paste that in, to confirm that this is a proper license for this data, right? In this case, it's not. The county does not provide an open license for that, so I'm not going to actually make any edits. But as an example, we would pull in that copyright info if it was available in the REST services page. And I'm going to go ahead and pretend that I've already com communicated with them or seen a different page that links to that license that grants it properly uh, to be used in OpenStreetMap. We also provide a wiki page option to let you document your import plan if that's of interest. We're trying to see a couple of different kind of push-pull on how much data to ask people to provide for relatively small quote-unquote imports in this case. Um, so I'm looking for feedback on this kind of stuff as well. What you see then next is the option to pick a feature type. So if I go in here and type building, I'll get some existing values populated in the lower section. Um, this is where we would see that preset image. We're still working on that. 
What you see here is the actual attribution for the features. This is a sample feature from that data set. So you can see that Boulder County has a source field, uh, structure type, I don't know what that is, a status, in this case, the example that it pulled out was a demolished building, uh, base elevation in terms of uh, feet above sea level, and then a height of the building. Uh, I can take any of these and choose to include those in my little mini import here. I'm gonna go ahead and take the height and put it in the name field just as an example and take the source, and you'll see these fields are pre-populated with the right fields from that building preset, and I'll put the source information into the, um, let's say, the address. The, in this case, this data set doesn't have great attribution for addressing. Uh, we could still use this, just the geometries. You'll see in the bottom, there's actually almost 41,000 buildings in this data set. I have 50 in my current view of the map. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and click on load and view. When this finishes loading, I'm gonna close the modal, and you'll see an orange, which is a little bit easier to see if I turn the imagery darker. Uh, you'll see in orange all those buildings I just pulled in. If I zoom out, you'll see it's just that area of interest. Um, and they're, they're in orange to basically say these have been added to the map. They're now full ID features. I can drag them and move things around, use all the same ID tools here as well. Um, but if I click on one of them, you'll see that I have this new button at the top for approving and rejecting a feature. So the idea for this is we're trying to hit the middle between making it easy to import existing geodata but not import 50 buildings without reviewing all of them. So as I go through here, I can kind of look and see in my tags I have the area mapped in, the address city value that I put in from that data set. So if you had an address, it could pull in that as you map those attributes. And if I'm happy with these, I can just go through one by one and basically approve them, at which point they turn green and become part of my edits to the actual OSM submission. So in theory, I could then go through and approve one or all of these and then submit the same way that I do with ID right now. It's just an example of the building footprints. Another one uh, to provide another example is from San Juan County, Washington. This is a, uh, a case where I actually do have permission to submit the data from Nick Peel. Nick, are you here, by the way? I wasn't sure if he was. Okay, so thanks to Nick uh, who gave me some examples. This is a, a folder of services from a county in the, in the islands of Puget Sound, and they have lots of really awesome data. They have parcels, they have soil maps, transportation, water features. Some of this is more or less relevant to OSM, but in this case, I wanted to look at what they had in the transportation layer, and I saw they had some nice driveways data. So if I copy that layer, I'll actually go back and show you something else here. If I copy that URL and open up another interface here, when I add that, I'll be asked to pick a layer from the service, and I'll pick that driveways layer. And as Nick was saying, we've done a lot of work to add in the presets here, so if I, look, if I type in driveway, I'll get that little nice preview image, and I can also map any of these attributes to the driveway tags. So I'll go ahead and take this FID and map it to the name, and then add the 16 driveways in my current view. Now I try to do that without confirming the license, and I get this little prompt to say, please confirm that you're okay to add this to OSM. I'll go back and check that. This is stored in my local storage, so when I come back in the same session, I don't get prompted every time for this, this server URL. When I add that to the map, let's see if it works. Looks like it just pulled in one. I'm gonna try that one more time. I wanted to kind of see that. Okay, so I added those features. These are some nice driveways, adding some really rich local data and some high, highly detailed data to OSM. You know, I don't think driveways are that relevant to routing, but we do support the feature. It is a very commonly used tag in OSM. I often add them in my local area because I think it makes the map look better. And here's some great examples of some high resolution data that you're probably not gonna get people just go out and doing on their own across an entire county. Um, yeah, so I'll get to that in a second. That's what I'm going to show here. So this is a good example where there's an offset, obviously, from this data and the OSM data. So this is why we want to have a manual review process where we have somebody go here and actually, if I was editing this, I would actually go in and correct those endpoints myself because we want to make sure that we have full routing connectivity between these different ways. Um, this is an area where I'm definitely looking for feedback as to how we could better control this. It's a very difficult I think automation and computer problem, but we're looking at ways to basically require you to look at each of these individually and approve those. Um, right now, if I did approve one of these and try to save it, I believe that ID would warn me that I have an unconnected way and would cause me to kind of review that during the submission process. So what we're hoping is we have enough kind of stop gaps on this functionality to get you to submit that quality data. Again, here you also see some automatically tagged information from the driveway uh, preset so that I don't end up 
submitting data that's missing these required or expected tags, as well as this nice preset. Again, this is part of the integration with it being directly an ID. In terms of how this is going to help the community or how I hope it'll help the community, um, to me it's about helping to fill in the map in areas that don't have, in, always, in all cases, a large local OSM community or a very active community. Um, it requires a lot of help to digitize data across large areas. Not all local areas have that kind of community or have a natural disaster occasion to do that through HOT or something like that. Uh, but a lot of areas in the US at least have really high quality geodata because counties have to manage this stuff in, in existing systems. It also lets you incorporate data layers like the driveways that I just showed that are either difficult or not common or not feasible to collect individually. You're not going to go out with a GPS device and take a GPX of every driveway in a county, uh, but that data has already been collected by somebody and could be used. We hope to provide correct attribution that may be not uh, easy to find if you're outside the area. So a lot of times these organizations maintain official addresses, official building heights, all this kind of information that otherwise you have to go find on your own uh, or ask about. Hopefully it'll help jumpstart local mappers that are discouraged by the lack of features in their area. Sometimes you don't know where to start and if there's your entire county missing a lot of building footprints, uh, it's pretty daunting to look at building all those yourself. Uh, and then really for me, it's about adding high quality data to OSM carefully that's already been collected carefully again by that community. Um, these, these municipalities or organizations are paying good money to good companies to collect it and we should take advantage of that in my opinion. Types of users of this tool would be people from municipal governments, uh, employees and GIS analysts, uh, potentially civic hackers and open data advocates who are familiar with REST services. Uh, I like to think of local GIS professionals as a great use case for this. Uh, people are familiar with Esri tools. We have many in the local community and they could all make use of this uh, pretty quickly. And then I think there's a really good use case uh, for disaster response, uh, hopefully working with HOT and with, with Mapathons as well. Um, a really good example, I, I did a, a fair amount of digitizing in South Florida as part of the hurricane response in HOT tasks. And there were areas of new development in, uh, in some of those cities where I knew that data was in an existing GIS database somewhere. Right? The imagery might have been a year or two old and it'd be great if we had newer imagery as well, but that data has already been created by somebody and I didn't really want to be redrawing images and buildings that already existed. So I think there's a great opportunity to, do, to work with HOT to uh, kind of look at how this might be used in certain cases where it's a fitting use case. We had a lot of back and forth on a previous issue in the ID repository on how we can look to prevent incorrect, low quality or unlicensed edits. And I think I've shown you a few of the ways we've tried to do that. Uh, one feature at a time is a big part of that. We want to have individual review of features. We want to require the user to mark the license as approved before they add it to the map. We're hoping to use this as also a chance to inform our users about the right kind of licensing. A lot of local government thinks their data is public uh, and open and totally available, but the fact that they don't kind of proactively say that actually holds it up from being included in OSM. And so we're hoping we can use this as a way to say, hey, if you would update your license on your service for five minutes, you can now make this available to be added to OSM by the local community. We're also suggesting that users link to a change uh, kind of import discussion either on GitHub or the OSM list uh, or the wiki when they submit a change set. Um, we're doing a few things to prevent overlapping buildings from being added. And as I mentioned earlier, looking at ways to do better vertex connections and integration of those features. Uh, that's certainly not an easy problem to solve and I have, I have no magic bullet, but we're going to look at how to do that in further releases of this. Just to briefly cover a few other recent OSM things at Esri, um, we have a pretty ad hoc approach to working at OSM. We have a number of people at the company who are very in integrated in the community and want to do work on that. Um, we've added a few things in the past year that I think are pretty exciting. Uh, Brian mentioned in his ID talk that we are, have provided our world imagery service now for access in the ID editor. Uh, and as well as all other OSM editors, which was really a tremendous licensing undertaking. Uh, we get our imagery from all kinds of different providers, local government, different commercial providers, you know, a thousand different licenses that we've signed from a legal perspective to make that available. To get all of those to agree, to allow it to be used for digitizing an OSM was a two and a half year process. So thank you for your patience in that, but I think it provides some really cool options uh, in ID. I'll show an example of that. I think I pulled it up. Okay, out of time, sorry. Um, so yeah, basically I'll just cover that. There's some areas where we have really good resolution and some interesting uh, information that's not normally available, as well as this little add-in, which is a control shift B kind of bonus inside of ID that shows you the detail level for that area. 
Um, happy to take questions. I have some more topics here. We'll be here all week at the booth. Um, I'm out of time, so I appreciate listening. Thank you. A lot of times there's a systematic difference between like the municipal government data and OpenStreetMap data. Like I work for King County, Washington, and all of our street types are abbreviated and OpenStreetMap wants full street types. Have you given any consideration to applying like a systematic text replacement filter when you're mapping your fields to the tags? Yeah, I've definitely thought about that. W one area would be either concatenating existing tags into one address tag or doing string replacements, that kind of thing. Yeah. I think we have set it up in a way that we can very easily add that. And this is, again, something we've tried to develop in the open and hopefully we can add in from the community to do that. But I think that's a great example of something that takes relatively a lot of knowledge to know how to do. If you're doing a big import, if we can make that easier, that would be awesome. OK. We're going to cut it off here so we can keep moving forward and make our Time frame today, so uh, I appreciate you guys coming up. Thanks. And I'd like to invite uh, Aaron Strop.